So just name and affiliation. Okay. What do you mean? Uh, oh, look at you. So. My name is Dr. Raju Tabat. I work at UCLA Medical Center in the Pediatric Neurology Division and also in the UCLA Center of Autism Research and Treatment. Okay, and can you sort of describe uh, TSC for, this is mostly a clinician-based audience, so what to look for, um, symptoms that will lead you to a diagnosis? Definitely. Let me start first a little bit with the pathophysiology of TSC and then we, it kind of relates to what you should be looking for as a clinician. So tuberous sclerosis complex is a genetic disorder and it's caused by mutations either in the TSC1 or the TSC2 gene. And mutations in this gene lead to overactivation of what we call the mTOR signaling pathway. Now that pathway is important because more recently or for some time now we're starting to develop medications that can target that pathway. But overactivation of that pathway leads to loss of control over cell growth and cell division, which is why we see many of the manifestations of pa that patients have with tuberous sclerosis complex, which is development of what we call non-malignant or benign growths, um, often termed tubers in the brain. But this can occur in the skin, the eyes, the kidneys, the heart, the lungs, the liver. So it's grossly manifested throughout the body. Now, things to look for as a clinician um, are actually quite evident in tuberous sclerosis complex because it's also known as a neurocutaneous syndrome. So you have neurologic syndromes, but you have cutaneous or skin findings. So often things that you can see secondary to this overactivation and this overgrowth. So things that you can see on these patients are hypomelanotic macules. So these are light patched macules throughout the body. You can also see angiofibromas on the face over generally in this distribution. Um, you can also see something called a chagrin patch as well. And I really encourage clinicians to look up some of these things because there's a vast amount of information and photos of this to help identify these on individuals with tuberous sclerosis complex. But even what's more important with TSC is because of these growths, we can identify this disorder at a very young age, even in utero. So with fetal ultrasounds or regular ultrasounds, you can identify the cardiac rhabdomyomas or the growths in the heart. And if there's concern for that, you can then do a fetal MRI to see these growths in the brain as well. And some of these growths in the brain are called cortical tubers or subependymal nodules or giant cell astrocytomas, and those are growths in the brain which lead to what we see causing epilepsy in, in children and adults with tuberous sclerosis complex. And that's another thing to look for as a clinician. So if you do see a patient where you're worried about this, you also want to be screening for epilepsy or concerns for epilepsy because those abnormal growths in the brain or abnormal cortical tissue can lead to areas of what we call epileptogenesis or ir irritability secondary to the structural abnormality in the brain. Okay, so let's talk about um, epilepsy and TSC. Um, what are the type of forms of seizures that occur? How are they treated? And does that treatment interfere with the underlying condition, pathophysiology? I don't know. It's okay. Just a question I just came up with. Okay. We can stick to the questions that I asked. No, I don't mind. Let me address that a little bit. Okay. All of those parts, the last part, might be a little bit more difficult. Not that I can't address it, but I think for this sort of audience yeah. or for you also. Okay. So it's a very good question in, in regards to what sort of epilepsy manifests in patient with tuberous sclerosis complex because it's a wide range. But one I want to highlight first is something called infantile spasms. And that is a seizure disorder or type of epilepsy that is quite common in children with tuberous sclerosis complex. An early identification of that particular seizure type is very important because it can lead to severe developmental issues. And we want to be very aggressive about that treatment. So in children with tuberous sclerosis complex, generally the first line treatment for that is something called Vigabitrin, uh, which is a medication that's been shown to have a lot of efficacy for infantile spasms, particularly in children with tuberous sclerosis complex. Now there's other treatment for infantile spasms, but that's sort of to highlight what we generally use in TSC. They also can have generalized seizures, partial seizures, tonic seizures, so really you can see any manifestation of epilepsy. And that's really important and sort of leads me into some of the study and work that I'm highlighting today at the American Academy of Neurology because there's been a lot of work in identifying that epilepsy, certain type of, types of epilepsy or age of onset ep of epilepsy can lead to difficulties in cognition with these children, with this children in TSC. 
And the earlier we identify those things, hopefully the earlier we can intervene leading to better outcomes. So what I'm highlighting today or here at the Academy is part uh, data that's part of a multi-site longitudinal study. And really it was looking at many different components because children with tuberous sclerosis complex are also at high risk for neurodevelopmental disorders. So aside from intellectual disability, also autism spectrum disorder. So in this study we looked at uh, the phenotype of autism within children with tuberous sclerosis complex, compared it to children with non-syndromic, um, so without a genetic etiology, uh, who have autism spectrum disorder and typically developing kids as well. But a subset from that that I looked at was the relationship between epilepsy that we see in these children and cognitive outcomes. So we use something called the Mullen Scales of Early Learning, which is a standardized development and cognitive assessment. And from that assessment, you get subscores, visual reception, gross motor, fine motor, nonverbal IQ, verbal IQ, and you can develop standardized scores for that. And the scores that I looked at in there were nonverbal IQ, verbal IQ, and the overall developmental quotient. And the two factors that I evaluated were age of seizure onset and presence of infantile spasms, this particular epilepsy type that we spoke about. And that's because it's been shown in many other studies to have one of the largest effects on cognition in this group of patients. So with this large cohort, I wanted to sort of identify to see if there were other particular epilepsy characteristics that we were seeing as well. So when we looked at this and when we used our statistical analysis, linear regression and t-test in order to compare nonverbal IQ and epilepsy, we found that earlier age of seizure onset led to a significantly lower nonverbal IQ, verbal IQ, and overall development, uh, lower development as well, or developmental quotient. And also, presence of infantile spasm similarly yielded worse cognitive outcomes as well. So the thought behind this, as we're addressing this, is in individuals with TSC, early screening is very important. So as we mentioned, when you see a patient where you might be concerned about that, that would be, should be number one that you're thinking about, seizures or epilepsy. And early treatment is also important. And there have also been some thought on whether or not these children should be treated prophylactically or be treated even before seizures manifest. Um, and that's also where a little bit of the work comes in, where I was discussing the mTOR pathway. And there have been thoughts to use um, medications that target that mTOR pathway in order to not only help with the growths in the brain, but with epilepsy as well. Okay. The, that would be the affinitor? The affinitor and rapamycin. So right now, are, you have to have the, the lesions, you have to visually see them before you can give the drug. But you would suggest maybe give the drug before those lesions occur and it has nothing to do with the lesions, you're dealing with the epilepsy. No, actually. So okay. Affinitor <laughs> and Rapamycin are very different than our anti-epileptic medications. So to focus on the anti-epileptic medications, that's more of what I was addressing too, is not lesion dependent. Um, so Affinitor is given in many cases to try to reduce the size of a SEGA or the subependymal giant cell astrocytoma, one of the growths that we see in the brain. The hope is reducing that size can of course lead to better outcomes for many reasons because that's an abnormal large growth in the brain. What I'm referring to is anti-epileptic medications. Um, so these are medications dedicated to treat seizures. Not that Affinitor and Rapamycin can't necessarily treat those, and there's a lot of studies in that, but those aren't particularly what we start kids on prophylactically. So the thought is maybe at a young age, not regardless of lesion, would it be helpful to start these kids on an anti-seizure medication to sort of avoid even the occurrence of seizures? But really what I think is more important to focus on is that if you know there's a child with tuberous sclerosis complex, being very vigilant about the fact that epilepsy affects I mean, up to 85% of these individuals and is the most common neurologic manifestation. So really addressing screening these children, asking the parents and obtaining EEG if you need to as well to make sure they're not having seizures. What was the third question I wrote down? Uh, the third question was, what's a typical day in oh, the life? Okay. okay. So that is a <laughs> yes. That's a very good question. A typical uh, day in the life of a, a child or an adult with tuberous sclerosis complex. Um, and I think that question really speaks to the heterogeneity of this disorder. Um, children are affected in many different ways. And that's one of the reasons we do the work we do 
to try to identify characteristics that might lead a child to more likely have a cognitive impairment, um, might likely lead them to have more refractory epilepsy, because you can have a child who has seizures every single day and are very difficult to control. And that, of course, is going to lend to a very different lifestyle for the family and that child, or a child who has very well-controlled seizures and subsequently um, is able to go on with many of their daily activities or other lifestyle activities, and also um, how the way that affects the family as well. So it's, it's very variable for this sort of common day for somebody with TSC. But that's why I think it's really important for us to continue to identify what are all the manifestations we see and, the, and ways to treat them early and intervene early so that we can lead, I guess you could say, not only to, of course, to better outcomes ultimately and functional outcomes, but to, and maybe to make those days a little bit less variable from patient to patient and make sure every single one of them are having a day in which they're able to get through the day, go to school, function in what they're doing, not worry about the seizures that they're having. Um, Okay. Two more questions. One, um, you <coughs> mentioned earlier where you could actually diagnose this in utero. Um, what would be the symptoms that make you even do that? Like, usually you would just have an ultrasound and everything looks fairly normal, but it's just like a gray blur. So why would you even think about going deeper? So two ways. One is, of course, because tuberous sclerosis complex can be autosomal dominant, so passed down from ch parent to child, or a new mutation as well, right? So not inherited, but a new mutation. So if you have a parent with TSC or tuberous sclerosis complex, you are gonna do additional screening for the child. So that would be the reason, sort of the instigation in order to do that. Otherwise, there really is, there is nothing, there really is no other symptoms from the mother or, other, or otherwise that would lead you to do specific TSC screening. But just from ultrasounds we have now that women who are pregnant get generally, you can identify some of those abnormalities. And if you do or there's concern, then that leads you to do more advanced imaging in utero, such as MRI. What would be the uh, things in the ultrasound that would lead to suspicion? So one of the biggest things are the cardiac rhabdomyomas, or abnormal growths that occur in the heart. And those can often be visualized on ultrasound, and that's generally a catalyst to move to higher imaging. Okay. Fine. I'll uh, just, for my, my friend Carrie, mm -hmm. shout out to TS Alliance. Yes. How have they helped you? Have you gotten any <coughs> research funding from them, or how are you involved in the Alliance name? Uh, we are, I mean, first of all, huge shout out to the TS Alliance. They are incredible. Um, I am particularly associated with the Southern California TS Alliance and Joanne Nagawa, Tara Palaj, um, Kristen Frausto, all incredible people who work a part of the TS Alliance and many more. I mean, I could go on and on. And they are so incredibly supportive of us wanting to come out and speak to the families, um, increase awareness about tuberous sclerosis complex and the neurodevelopmental disorders that are associated with that. Early intervention. Um, they've been very active in getting us to come out and speak to a mother's group as well. Uh, we'll be going to the Step Forward and Cure Walk that the TS Alliance has in Southern California and throughout the nation. Um, they have given our institution support as well, particularly in epilepsy research. Um, and I, I can just speak volumes of these families and the children as well. They've just been incredible, not only in regards to being so open to talk to us, but for their children to be a part of these studies so that we can gain more information to help other children with tuberous sclerosis complex. So huge thank you to the families of the TS Alliance and the TS Alliance in general. And I very much look forward to continuing to work with them. Okay. Anything else you would like to add? Um, non TSE <laughs> stuff. Are you do, doing any other presentations here? <clears throat> yes, actually. So, you know, one thing I'd like to say it's exciting it's Autism Awareness Month, um, and my focus is neurodevelopmental disorders. I'm a behavioral neurologist, and I uh, focus a lot on autism spectrum disorder. So, I'll be giving the year in review plenary session on Thursday morning, uh, talking about neurodevelopmental disorder and some highlights in there. So, um, I think it's important to know that it's Autism Awareness Month. There's a lot of activities going out there to increase increase awareness in autism and support for autism. Um, the Economist, actually, this month, uh, the cover is about autism as well, so I'd encourage people to get out there and read and understand more about this disorder and become more involved. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if autism ends up being about a dozen rare conditions. 
you can just see it happening. Like yeah. I was talking to the Bell and McDermott syndicate yes. people. Yes, uh-huh. The PMS girl, I like to call <laughs> <laughs> And that's sort of a form, but there's several other rare diseases where one of the primary symptoms is actually autism. Yes, exactly. And they are the ones that are, I had this earlier discussion, the rare disease community. They've got it down to the sh shrink, shrink, Genes, the shank, shank, shank three, yeah, shank, shank three. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones that are focusing on that, not the autism. And they're the ones that are going to change autism. And it's just an interesting. It is, and I, I agree and disagree in that. I will speak to the fact that you are right. They are definitely the groups that are focusing very much on that, and it's the Rare Diseases Consortium, these groups who are looking particularly at fragile X syndrome, Smith McGinnis syndrome, Felix McDermott, tuberous sclerosis complex, Duke fifteen Q. We now know so many genetic etiologies that confer this high risk for neurodevelopmental disorders that individual group work but also even sort of global with autism speaks and a lot of our research centers um, are looking at this too to figure out what's the relationship between the genetic etiology and the behavioral outcome as well so they're great i, c I can only speak on that but i have to say it is really a global sort of work toward that you'd say again where i was wrong because my wife wants to hear that uh, where? Oh. <laughs> okay. Thank okay. you, ma'am. Thank you.